Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jake Stackowitz, and I'm excited to be here today giving this webinar with Golden Software. Today, I'm going to be covering all things gridding from the import of your raw data to the final map presentation. The topics that we're going to go over today are what is a grid file and how do I turn my field data into a grid, what grid based maps can be made in Surfer, what gridding methods does Surfer offer, which gridding method fits best with my data, and how can I convert my grid into my customer's preferred format. There's going to be a few stopping points during the webinar where I take a couple of minutes to answer any questions. You can send your questions to the webinar host via the Q&A located on the Zoom toolbar at any time. Type in your question and it'll be sent to the webinar host who will either answer it or forward it to me. And please use the Q&A function rather than the chat. This will allow the host to ensure we see all questions in a timely manner. Feel free to send in all of your questions. If we don't have time to answer them during the webinar, we will answer them via email once the webinar is complete. And this webinar is being recorded, so later this week we will post the recording along with the data used in the webinar. And we'll send each of you a link when it's posted so you can test these examples out for yourself. But now let's get started. First, I want to provide an overview on what a grid in Surfer is. A grid file is an array of uniformly spaced grid nodes arranged in rows and columns that represent a geographic area or workspace. Each grid node stores a numeric data value that represents some sort of geographic attribute, such as elevation or surface slope. That geographic attribute is tied to that unit of space and is known as the Z value. Each grid node is then referenced by its XY coordinate location and the coordinates can be in a real world coordinate system that is tied to the Earth's surface, or they can be in a local system that you define for yourself. In order to help visualize what kind of data can be used to create a grid file, I'll go ahead and go over this sample data sheet now. This sample data is XYZ data in the format of latitude, longitude, and elevation data surrounding the mountain town of Crested Butte in Colorado. My X, Y coordinates are in columns A and B, and my Z data values are in columns C. It's not an issue if you have extra data in your sheet going past those first three columns. During the grid data dialog, we have the options to map our data to the correct columns. So if you have an incredibly large sheet of data with lots of information, that's totally fine. And eventually we're going to be taking this raw data through the gridding process. We can think of the gridding process as interpolating a surface from our XYZ data, which becomes known as our grid file. Currently within Surfer, there are nine map types you can create from a grid file. And this encompasses 65% of all the map types that we offer in Surfer. And before I go into the gridding process with our Crested Butte elevation data, I'll go ahead and touch on what those map types are and why they would be useful. So each map type on this screen now is created from the same grid, which represents the elevation near Telluride, Colorado. First, we have a contour map. Contour maps are really the bread and butter of Surfer, and I'm sure many of you are intimately familiar with them. A contour map is a two-dimensional representation of three-dimensional data. The first two dimensions are the x and y coordinates, and the third dimension, the z value, is represented by lines of equal value. The relative spacing of the contour lines indicates the relative slope of the surface, and this is most often used for elevation data, but it can be used for other purposes such as a heat map or density map. Next, we have color relief maps, which are raster images based on your grid file. Color relief maps assign colors on a color scale based on the Z values from a grid file. No data regions on the color relief map can be shown as a separate color or as a transparent fill. And from the property manager of a color relief map, we can do things such as interpolate pixels to create a smoother image or adjust the hill shading to enhance the layer's depth and appearance.
After that, we also have a view shed layer. View shed layers highlight the region of a map that are visible or invisible from a transmitter location. We can see this symbol here in the top left, and that is our transmitter location. And then all the areas in red on the map are the visible areas from that location. From the property manager, we can change the map to display invisible areas instead if we preferred that. And we can also alter properties such as the obstruction height above the surface, the view shed radius, and the angle. View sheds can be added to any 2D grid based map, and a view shed can also be added to a 3D surface map that is displayed with no tilt and in the orthographic view. Surfer also offers a grid values map. Grid values map displays symbols and labels at grid node locations across the map, indicating the grid node values from your input grid file. If I was to open this grid values map in Surfer's 3D view, we would see these symbols overlaid a 3D render of the XYZ data from our original grid file. We also have one grid and two grid vector maps. These display direction and magnitude data using individually oriented arrows. At any grid node on the map, the arrow points in the downhill direction of the steepest descent, and the arrow length is proportional to the slope magnitude. This is a one grid vector map. You would use a two grid vector map if you had two separate sets of gridded data that you wanted to display vectors for on the same map. A two grid vector map is a good map type for displaying Cartesian or polar data. Surfer also contains a watershed map layer. Watershed maps display the direction that water flows across the grid. The watershed map breaks the grid into drainage basins and streams. You can assign a color scheme to, to your basins, and you can edit the line properties for your streams. One of the newer map types added into Surfer recently is the peaks and depressions map type. A peaks and depressions map creates polygons around peaks and depressions in a grid file. The polygons represent the first or last closed polygon around an area where drainage flows away from it if it's a peak or into it if it's a depression. Peaks and depressions areas can be labeled or hatchered. The minimum and maximum points can be located with a symbol and a report can be generated with statistical information about each peak or depression. For this set of data, we have 99% all peaks which are represented in red and this one tiny depression down here at the bottom left and that it would be represented in blue. For 3D options, Surfer has the 3D wireframe map, which is a three-dimensional representation of your grid file. Wireframes are created by connecting Z values along lines of constant X and Y. Each XY intersection occurs at a grid node, and the height of the wireframe is proportional to the Z value assigned to that node. Wireframes can be used to overlay other map type layers on top to create a more dynamic model. And the last grid based map type in the 2D plot view is the 3D surface map. A 3D surface map creates a filled colored three dimensional representation of your grid file. The colors, lighting, overlay, and mesh can be altered on a surface from the property manager and multiple 3D surface maps can be layered to create a block diagram. Finally, any grid-based map can be opened and viewed in Surfer's 3D view. Even if you don't necessarily see the 3D representation in the 2D plot window, uh, for example, this grid values map, all we see are these symbols. But if I select the map object in the contents window and then go to the properties manager and click view 3D view, I can now see these grid value symbols overlaid onto a 3D surface of our original Telluride elevation grid. 
and that's going to cover the nine grid-based maps that we can make in Surfer. Before I start diving into the actual gridding process, does anybody have any questions so far? Okay, one question that I'm seeing is, do these map types have to be created using the Surfer grid file type, or can you use any other grid type, um, for example, like an ASCII file or a DEM? Um, no, these don't have to be the Surfer grid file type, which is a GRD. Uh, you can create these maps using a file uh, such as an ASCII or DEM, um, and we have a list of supported import file types uh, Surfer can read most grid types from other programs. Also, if you have the raw data for those grids, uh, I'm about to go over the gridding process to create the Surfer GRD file type. Okay, and I'm not seeing any other questions yet, so let's go ahead and move on. I'll stop a few more times during this webinar for more as they come up, so feel free to send anything that pops into your brain into the Q&A. So let's dive into actually gridding this Crested Butte data set that I have open now. This data currently is saved as a DAT, but any supported data file format, such as a TXT file, CSV, or Excel spreadsheet would also work as your input data file. A helpful tip when gridding would be to take a look at the spatial distribution of your data before going through the entire gridding process as this may inform you on what options you choose while gridding, or just let you know if there are irregularities in your data you weren't aware of. We can visualize the spatial distribu distribution of our data here in a new blank plot. Uh, I'm gonna create a class post map to do so. And we can do that by clicking home on the banner and then going to new map post, class post. Then I'll select our input data file, which is this crested butte.dat. And once that class post map has been created, I can also add a legend by clicking map tools, add to map legend. And I'll zoom in on this so we can get a better view of it. And now we can see that based on these five colored dots, what my elevation values look like across the area that I'm going to be gridding. This data looks as expected as the purple, pink, and red lower elevation values are the area where the actual town of Crested Butte sits. And these higher green and blue dots are the mountain peaks uh, of the mountain range surrounding the town. And since this looks how I'd expect it, I'm gonna go ahead and start the gridding process now. To do so, I'd go to the ribbon and click grids, new grid, grid data. This will open up the grid data dialog, which really is the command center for gridding in Surfer. And that has several steps that I'm going to walk us through now. The first step would be choosing our input data file, and I can do so by clicking browse and then selecting our crested butte.dat file. As we can see, Surfer automatically sets my XYZ data as my first three columns of data. For our purposes, that doesn't actually work. Uh, we want column B longitude to be our X value. And we want column A latitude to be our Y value. Then column C, our altitude and elevation values works for our Z, that's correct. If you ever forgot what columns you're data is in, you can click this view data button right here to open up a minimized static view of your data. This can be helpful if maybe there's not titles for your data columns or you just want to double check that what you thought was correct is correct. Our next option here in the first page of the grid data dialog is the filter data button. You can use the filter data button if you have duplicate data where the same X, Y point location has multiple Z values, or if you wish to apply a data exclusion filter, for example, to eliminate all data with a Z value in a particular range. 
from this filter data button, we can tell Surfer to keep our first data point, or we can choose um, a more advanced statistical option. We can set the tolerance for what Surfer would consider a duplicate data point. Or we can also enter in our own custom data exclusion filter here in this bar. For example, if I wanted to exclude all data points in the file with a Z value of negative 999, I would enter Z equals negative 999 here in this data exclusion filter. Lastly, we have the statistics button here. Clicking this opens up a very in-depth statistical report from our data. I pulled it over here. Uh, this will show you things such as the number of data points in your file, the minimum and maximum data point, the average data point, and several other pages of statistical information that you may or may not feel, use, feel is useful depending on what your overall go goal is while gridding. Personally, we do not need it for this webinar, so I'm going to close out and not save that report. The next step of the gridding process is to now select our gridding method. Surfer offers a choice of 12 gridding methods here. And later on in this webinar, I will cover what different gridding methods are for. But most users are going to go ahead and select the Krieging gridding method. Krieging provides a very good estimate of most Earth systems. So this could be data sets based on groundwater or elevation surfaces. Specifically, this data set that we're gridding is an elevation surface, so I'm going to go with Krieging. And once you've selected a gridding method, you can fine tune it using the advanced options for that method. Each gridding method has its own set of options, and some of the options are the same or similar to those of other gridding methods while well, other options are specific only to a specific gridding method. You can get to these advanced options by clicking Next. And as Krieging is the most commonly used gridding option, uh, I'll cover a Krieging specific advanced option, which is the variogram properties. The primary purpose of the variogram options are to best fit your data to the variogram modeling parameters. This is a fairly advanced statistical concept that I'm not going to go into today, but you can be sure that about 99% of the time, the default options Surfer selects for you are going to meet your needs. And if you have variogram questions, we can refer you to some literature on the subject in our help dialog after the webinar. For some methods during this stage of the advanced options, there is an anisotropy option, which I'll expand right here. Anisotropy allows you to specify the ratio and angle for the preferred orientation of your data. Anisotropy is used to introduce a bias or trend direction when calculating your grid. For example, if the local trend direction of carbonate mounds was northwest, northwest to southeast, you would apply a 135 degree anisotropy direction when gridding. Data points that are further away in the direction of anisotropy will have the same weight as closer data points that are perpendicular to the anisotropy direction. The grid data advanced options dialog also has a search neighborhood section. This controls which data points are considered to be considered by the gridding operation when interpolating the Z value of grid nodes. The search rules define the number of data points to include when interpolating a grid node Z value. The search ellipse defines the shape and size of the searchable area around each grid node to use to calculate that grid node Z value. Data points that fall outside the search ellipse for a grid node are not considered when calculating that grid node Z value. And if no data points fall within the search ellipse, then that grid node will be blanked. At this point in the gridding data dialog, some gridding options will have a break lines or break lines and fault section. This allows you to include a break line or fault file when you grid your data. Some gridding methods support break lines some support break lines and faults, and some do not support either of them. 
We also have the cross validate section, which allows you to perform cross validation on your grid data. Generally, cross validation can be considered an objective method of assessing the quality of a gridding method or to compare the relative quality of two or more candidate gridding methods. In Surfer, cross validation can be used with all gridding methods, and you can save the results file by specifying the file name and location in the cross validation results file section. For details and more information on cross-validation parameters, you can click this question mark here at the top to open up our help section, which will dive into those parameters. Finally, we have the output section of the grid data dialog. This grid geometry section at the top is where you would change parameters concerning the size of your resulting grid file. You can choose to set a particular X and Y minimum and maximum value for the grid file. This is useful if you're trying to match the extents to another grid file, or if you want your grid to be an exact size. You can also choose the X and Y spacing, which is the spacing between grid nodes. The spacing is directly linked to the number of nodes right here. The smaller the grid spacing, the higher the number of grid nodes. A higher number of grid nodes will increase the resolution of your grid and vice versa if you went the other way. You can increase the number of nodes value up to 2 billion grid nodes. However, your computer will most likely run out of memory long before you can create a grid that large. And the more grid nodes you have, the more memory it's going to take in your computer to create that grid file. In the output grid geometry section, we can also specify to have the geometry copied from an already existing grid file. This can save you a ton of time if you're trying to create grid files with matching resolution and extent. In previous versions of Surfer before version 22, it was required to have grids with matching geometry to perform grid math on multiple grid files. So if you're running a version lower than 22, this can be a crucial step if you have multiple grids. Further down in the dialog, you can set the grid Z limits. This is useful if the method you are using extrapolates Z values beyond the range of your input data and you do or don't want that to happen. There's also an option to assign no data outside of an alpha shape or a convex hull. An alpha shape is a tight polygon boundary created around your data points that is later added as a polygon object to the map. A convex hole, similarly, can be used to assign no data outside of the smallest polygon possible surrounding your data, but it won't create a polygon object in your final map. At the Z transform section, we can do things such as perform a log transformation on our Z values. And if we already have polygons in a base layer in our map, we could choose that layer here in the no data polygon boundary section and use those polygons to assign no data in our final grid. And now that we've covered all of the settings in the grid data dialog, I'm going to go ahead and grid this data now. And I would choose how I want that gridded data to be mapped here in the output grid section. Personally, I like these options of adding the grid as a new contour map to this plot. So I can go ahead and click Finish now. Surfer will send you a message letting you know that the grid file has been created, and you can just click OK. And then I'll go ahead and hide our class post map. And to make this look a little bit better than black and white, I will select the contours map in the contents window then go to Levels in the Property Manager, fill my contours, and choose a new color scale. All right, and now before we get into what all of those different gridding methods at the start of the dialog do, I'm going to take a minute to answer any questions that came up during the gridding process. Okay, one question I see is, does Surfer automatically apply the variogram derived optimal settings, or do you need to manually tell it to do so? 
Um, yes, Surfer does 99% of the time the automatically set variogram optimal settings. Uh, those are going to work best for you. Um, and if you manually need to tell it to do so, uh, we are happy to send uh, some resources your way to help you determine what settings would work best. Okay, another question I saw earlier was many of the map types on our previous section of the webinar are specific to elevation, uh, but less are applicable to something like mapping nitrogen in soils. Um, and while I may be using elevation as an example here today, uh, you could use many of these map types for a different type of data, such as soil nitrogen. Um, you would use soil nitrogen as your Z, and you could use something like the peaks and depressions map here, to which currently show you mountains. You could use it to do the highest and lowest levels of nitrogen in your soil where the highest values would be the red and the lowest would be the blue. Okay, thank you for those questions, everybody. If we did not get to your question right now, uh, we're moving on to the next section, but we will follow up with you after the webinar by email. And now let's start diving into what the various gridding methods available in the grid data dialog do. Uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to cover our eight most popular gridding methods today. And here on this new tab, I have eight different contour maps that represent the eight methods I'm going to cover. All of these maps are generated from that same Crested Butte data set that we just walked through the gridding process of so that we can really see uh, the differences and discrepancies in between the methods. The first method we're going to touch on today is inverse distance to a power. Inverse distance to a power is a fast gridding method, but it has the tendency to generate bullseye patterns of concentric contours around the data points. We can see this happening here where we have these bullseye patterns where a different gridding method created a long smooth contour from that data. Inverse distance to a power does not extrapolate Z values beyond the range of your data if that is something you want to prevent from happening. Next, we have Krieging. This is the method we just used in our earlier example. And it is one of the more flexible gridding methods since it's useful for gridding almost any type of data set. With most data sets, Krieging with the default variogram settings is perfectly effective. And in general, our support team would most often recommend this method. The only caveats with Krieging is that once your data set starts getting significantly larger, Krieging can slow down quite a bit. And Krieging will also extrapolate grid values beyond your data's Z range. So if that's something you want to prevent from happening, use a different method or in the advanced options, set your limits accordingly. Next, we have the minimum curvature method. This method generates smooth surfaces and is fast for most data sets, but it can create high magnitude artifacts in areas of no data. The internal tension and boundary tension advanced options during the gridding data dialog allow you to control over the amount of smoothing. A minimum curvature can also extrapolate values beyond your data Z range if that is something you do or don't want to happen. After that, we have the modified Shepherd's method. This is similar to inverse distance to a power, but it reduces the generation of those bullseye patterns, especially when a smoothing factor is applied in the advanced options. For our data set, this gridding method pretty clearly drastically changed our final grid as compared to all the other methods. So this would probably not be the method that I choose for our final map presentation. Modified Shepherd's method can extrapolate values beyond your data Z range. Next, we have natural neighbor. 
Natural neighbor generates good contours from data sets containing dense data in some areas and sparse data in others. It does not extrapolate data in areas without data. And our example data set is really all dense data, so this isn't quite the right fit. Natural neighbor does not extrapolate Z grid values beyond the range of your data. After that, we have nearest neighbor. This method is useful for converting regularly spaced or almost regularly spaced XYZ data files to grid files. When your observations lie on a nearly complete grid with just a few missing holes, this method is useful for filling in those holes or creating a grid file with the no data values assigned to those locations where no data is present. Nearest neighbor does not extrapolate Z grid values beyond the range of your data. After that, we have radial basis function. This is another very flexible gridding method and it compares nicely to Krieging since it generates some of the best overall interpretations of most data sets. Um, like I said, this method is going to produce a result quite similar to Krieging and is another one our support team would most often recommend. And finally, we have triangulation with linear interpolation. This is one of the fastest gridding methods. And when you use smaller data sets, triangulation with linear interpolation will generate distinct triangular faces between your data points. Triangulation with linear interpolation does not extrapolate Z values beyond the range of your data. And now after going all of those Going over all those individually, I will zoom out so we can see them all at once again. And I have a few rules of thumb that we can take away when we're choosing our gridding method. I'll go over those now for very small data sets being less than 10 points. We would recommend using Krieging or the radial basis function. Oftentimes with such a small data set, you may just want to define the trend of your data and you can use the polynomial regression options during the gridding data dialog to do that with either gridding method. And with 10 or fewer points, gridding is gonna be extremely fast. So it won't take much of your time to play around with the options on both methods. With small data sets being less than 250 observations, Krieging with the default linear variogram or radial basis function with the multi-quadratic function produce solid representations of most data sets at that size. With moderate sized data sets from 250 to 1000 observations, triangulation with linear interpolation is gonna be fast and create a good representation of your data. Although Krieging or radial basis functions are going to generate those grids more slowly, they also are going to produce a good data representation. And finally, for larger data sets being more than 1,000 observations, if you want to do it fast, I would recommend using either minimum curvature or triangulation with linear interpolation, as these are the faster data methods and will produce a solid representation. But keeping with our common theme for all data sets, Krieging or radial basis function is going to most likely produce the best map. But just keep in mind, once you start getting above 1,000 observations and into very large data sets, those methods are going to slow down quite a bit. And after seeing all of this, uh, you may be thinking that it seems like an awful lot of work to go through that gridding process that we just walked through up to 12 times. And you would be right. And that is why we have created a sample script that is publicly available on our website and already installed on your computer in the Surfer sample files. This script is gonna automatically generate this exact set of maps here, but using your own data set, it will create these maps and these eight gridding methods. If you haven't ever used Scripter with Surfer, uh, you may be unaware that Scripter automatically is installed on your computer when you download Surfer. 
and you can use it to execute a number of scripts other than this gridding method script. So depending on what operating system you are running, if you search your programs for scripter, it should come up in your somewhere in your computer and you would be able to open it up with no extra download required. So I'm going to open up scripter here in this window. And this is what a blank new instance of scripter looks like when you boot up the program. To then run the script, you would click file open. And then you could, for the purpose of this webinar, I have this script already saved in a folder that I can easily open up right away. But if it was your first time trying to find this script, the default file path that the sample file is saved at is going to be C drive, program files, golden software, surfer, samples, scripts. Once you open up that scripts folder, you would be able to then select this grid data comparison.bas file. And then you could click open. And the great thing about this script is that it's already set up to run without any adjustments whatsoever, if you're less familiar with automation and scripting in general. And to run it, all we would have to do is click script run. We then follow the prompts as they come up. And the first prompt is to select our data file. So I'll select our crestedbute.dat and click open. After that, you'll get a prompt to enter your X column number. And if you remember from the start, our X column number is two. So I'll put two for X. Then we'll be prompted for our Y, which for our data set is one. And finally, we'll be prompted for our Z, which for our data set is column three. Once you click OK, the script will start running in the background. And if I minimize my scripter window, you can see that a new instance of Surfer was opened up and it created those eight uh, maps that we saw earlier in those eight gridding methods. Uh, the only difference is the contour levels aren't filled because I did that for the webinar purposes. And since it looks better when the contours are filled. I'm going to go ahead and close out of this instance of Surfer so that we can choose our gridding method on the more nicely filled level contour maps. Um, maybe unsurprisingly from the eye test, I do prefer this Krieging gridding method as compared to all of our others. And that works well because Back in this other tab, we already created a contour map using the Krieging method. So I can go ahead and use this to create our final map for presentation. But then one last thing before we get this ready for presentation that I want to touch on would be converting a GRD file into a different grid file type. Uh, many people in the geoscience industries they, we collaborate with team members who might not be using Surfer and Golden Software wants to make sure that that collaboration goes as smooth as possible. So we do offer many different file types that you can convert any GRD file you make in Surfer into. The process to do so is very simple. You would go to this top banner here, click Grids, Edit, Convert. From this, we would choose our GRD grid file that we want to convert, which for us is going to be crestedbutte.grd, and click Open, which will then bring us to the Save Grid as dialog. And from this drop-down menu, you can see there is a large range of different file types that we can choose. For this example, I'll go ahead and choose the WRL VRML file type. And then I can give my newly converted file a name such as Crested Butte VRML and click Save. Click OK on your export options. 
and then to show you guys that it is that quick and easy, here is my uh, folder that that VRML file was saved to. Uh, and this would be ready to use in any other program if I wanted to. So now let's get to the last section of this webinar, which is going to be creating our final map for presentation. As I mentioned earlier, during the grid map type section, we can add any other grid based map type as a layer to my map using the same grid that we already have created. For example, if I was interested in what my visibility would be from the peak of Crested Butte Mountain right here, I could add a view shed map layer by going to home on the top banner, going to add to map, add layer, selecting the view shed map layer. And that will open up this crosshair where I will drop my transmitter. And like I said, I'm interested in what the visibility from the very peak of this mountain is going to be. So I'll drop my transmitter right there. And right off the bat, I can tell that having my visible areas in green doesn't look great against our green background for our contour levels. But I can change this by selecting the view shed layer in the contents window, then expanding our fill properties and choosing the foreground color to be red. And also, as I showed during the earlier grid map types section of this webinar, uh, every grid based map can be viewed in Surfer's 3D view, which we can open up by clicking the map object in the contents window. And then in the properties manager, going to view 3D view. And there we go. Now we have this great 3D model of the Crested Butte mountain range and what the visibility would be from the peak of Crested Butte mountain if I was ever bold enough or in shape enough to summit that mountain. And that is going to wrap up our presentation for today. Do we have any last questions that came up? during that last part of the webinar. Okay, I'm not immediately seeing any new questions. Um, we'll be sticking around here for a couple more minutes, so feel free to send those in should something come up that you wanna ask before we leave. Uh, once again, a recording of this webinar is gonna be posted shortly on our website and we'll email each of you a link when it is posted. If you haven't already, I would recommend renewing your Surfer maintenance. Uh, we're on Surfer version 22. And if you renew your maintenance, you get access to some great new features like the 3D drill holes. And you can also, uh, in the spirit of gridding, you can use grid math on two different size grids. So uh, recommend renewing your maintenance. And thank you, everybody, for attending. We really appreciate it.